It is a joy to be with you. Um, this is my neck of the woods. I have good friends um, from uh, all the years I've spent in New Jersey and on this jurisdiction. It is good to be back and to see folks. Um, it is good to be here. Uh, I hope you know what a treasure you have in Phyllis Bowers and in the foundation that's here at Susquehanna Conference. When you, when you don't get a chance to travel beyond the walls of your conference, you don't, you don't get a chance to hear uh, about the excitement that people have in their voices uh, when they talk about what goes on here in the Susquehanna Conference um, and about the work of this foundation. And Phyllis has kind of set the bar very high for the other foundations um, in terms of not only managing those funds which get entrusted to you, but also in reaching out to serve local churches. Um, and I've been the stewardship director since only since October uh, and I think I've been, she's invited me here, I think at least four times to do workshops. And so, uh, again, when I talk to the other foundation directors, I say, well, when are you going to catch up with Susquehanna? Because um, they're really doing a lot to help local churches strengthen their stewardship. And so I do want to celebrate that also this morning. Um, I'm thrilled that they're live streaming and um, that my wife can sit at her desk and sneak a, a peek at what I'm doing to make sure that I really am where I, I tell her I am. <laughs> Um, I want to thank Jack for that amazing music um, that got us prepared for worship. Um, and I have to tell you that as I came in this morning and I looked at my uh, Link newspaper, I saw that you were going to have uh, the preaching of Bishop Lowry. And that's good news for me because I've heard Bishop Lowry preach. And so in 20 minutes from now, when we're all done, whether I make it to base or I strike out, nobody will remember because you will have heard Bishop Lowry preach, I think, twice. And that's what will stay with you, and uh, you're in for a treat. Uh, he's a wonderful preacher and a wonderful leader in the church. Let me share with you um, one additional scripture uh, that I'd like to share as I begin this morning, and it is from um, the Gospel of Mark. Uh, I'll be reading chapter 10, uh, 17 through 27. I'm reading from uh, the tablets. You know, remember Moses got the tablets? <laughs> Which... By the way, I'll do a little mention to you, um, the, the Common English Bible, the newest Bible that's released by Cokesbury, if you have a Kindle, or uh, it's free today on Amazon. So don't wait. You don't have to do it now, right now. <laughs> Everybody's getting out their phones, going to download it. It's free on Amazon today. From Mark chapter 10, verses 17 to 27. As Jesus continued down the road, a man ran up and knelt before him and said, Good teacher, what must I do to obtain eternal life? And Jesus replied, Why do you call me good? No one is good except for, God, one, for the one God. You know the commandments. Don't commit murder. Don't commit adultery. Don't steal. Don't give false testimony. Don't cheat. And honor your father and your mother. And teacher, the man responded, I've kept all these things since I was a boy. And Jesus looked at him carefully, and he loved him. But he said to him, you are lacking one thing. Go and sell what you own and give the money to the poor, and then you will have treasure in heaven, and come and follow me. But the man was dismayed at this statement and went away saddened because he had many possessions. And looking around, Jesus said to his disciples, it will be very hard for the wealthy to enter the God's kingdom his words startled the disciples, and so Jesus told them again, Children, it's difficult to enter the kingdom. It's easier for a camel to squeeze through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter God's kingdom. And they were shocked even more. And they said to each other, Well, then who can be saved? And Jesus looked at them carefully and said, It's impossible with human beings, but not with God. All things are possible with God. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. I'm always amazed at the way that phrases get into our, into our language and into our usage. And sometimes those phrases come out of our popular culture. Sometimes they come from commercials. Things like, where's the beef? Or I've fallen and I can't get up. And phrases like that that become kind of commonplace for us. Sometimes they come out of movies. And as I prepared to speak to you today, I thought of a phrase that's become kind of part of our culture that comes out of a movie that's probably 16 years old now. 
The movie was a movie called Jerry Maguire. Some of you I look out there are probably old enough to remember Jerry Maguire. And Jerry Maguire was a story about a young sports agent who um, is living the life at the top of his game and he has a crisis of conscience. And so one day he, he tries to turn the direction of the agency, the sports agency he works for, and in the process of that he loses his job. He's fired. And he struggles to retain some of his clients and is only, he's down to one last client. It's a football player by the name of Ron, Rod Tidwell. And he gets on the phone with Rod in desperation and Rod asks him to do one thing. He asks him to say a phrase with him. How many, who knows that phrase? <laughs> show me the money! And Tom Cruise says, show me the money, show you the money. Show the money. He says, no, 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 you gotta say it, you gotta say it with enthusiasm, you gotta scream it, you gotta say, show me the money! And that's become part of our culture, and it's, it's true in many ways that it's kind of permeated. Not just the usage of that phrase, but that attitude. And it, it comes from that moment in that movie. And so you're thinking, okay, well, here's the stewardship guy, and he's come to uh, Messiah College, and we're going to talk about show me the money. Amen. Where are the plates? Anybody got the plates standing by? No. But what I thought about is that there is another phrase in that movie that you may not know as well. Maybe you do. It's also become part of our culture. Dorothy is the young woman who goes to work with Jerry Maguire. Renee Zellweger plays the part. And of course, as we know from the very beginning of the movie, that somehow their lives will come together. And so at one point, Jerry Maguire realizes how important their relationship is. And he begins to try and tell her in this deep kind of way about, about his life and how his life is complete with her. And she stops him and she says something to him. And does anybody know what she says? You're good. You had me at hello. I like to, I like to look at those two phrases. Because, you know, when we come to stewardship, people think that it's all about show me the money. But you know, stewardship is about relationships. It's about a God who loved us before we were born, before we did anything to deserve it. It's about a God who doesn't say to us, show me the money, but says, you had me at hello. A God who strives to be in relationship with us. To find that relationship and to believe that. Look at your Bible sometime, start at the beginning and read through, and you'll see that what God's desire is, is to be in relationship with us. It starts with Adam and Eve, and it follows through the story. It's, it's, it goes through Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, where God says, I have a covenant that I want to make with you, and the covenant is simple. If you will be my people, I will be your God. It's about relationships. It's about that love of God. And God wants to bring all these things into our lives, all this richness, all this goodness. He wants to be in that relationship with us. And so, for God, it's about, you had me at hello. Before you were born, Scripture says, when, you, when we were being formed in our, in our mother's womb, God loved us already. We had him. We had him at hello, at the very beginning. I'm becoming more and more sold on this idea that relationships are really what it's all about. I attended a church for a number of years in Nashville, and this church had plastered all over their walls little signs that said just that. It's all about relationships. They were on the doors coming in and out of the church. They were in the hallways. They were in the Sunday school classes. They were even on the men's rooms and the ladies' rooms. So you wouldn't, you wouldn't forget that it was all about relationships. It wasn't their mission statement. It was a core value in that church. The relationships were important. You folks of the laity are representing the laity of this great conference. And you know that it's about relationships. 
It's about the people that reach out to one another, the people who hold each other together. But even more, it's about that relationship that we have with a God who in love has sought to enter into covenant with us. It's about relationship with Jesus Christ, the embodiment of that love, who actually calls us to a role, a discipleship role, and sends us into the world, to the ends of the earth even, to make that love real to people. That's our response to the Jesus relationship. It's about our relationship to the church, to Christ's body in the world, and making ourselves available to the mission to which that church has been called. It's all about relationships. Now, I need to make a little side note here. Raising money for the church is important. I'm not going to deny that. The money that you give and your people and your congregation give makes a difference in what your church can do in mission and ministry. I wouldn't deny that for a moment. Their giving will either empower or cripple the ministry of your church. And that's the truth. If your church is filled with folks who are generous and are mature in their discipleship and are giving, you will begin to be looking for ways that you can expand the ministry of your church. If your church gets into a mindset of scarcity and that there's not enough and begins to pull in, you'll find less and less opportunity to serve the church. And you know, the reality is that the world needs the ministry that your church does now more than ever. And so funding the ministry of your church is important. It has consequences, not just for your congregation and not just for the United Methodist Church, but for the cause of the mission of Jesus Christ and the kingdom of God here in the world. Creating revenue for the church is important. But what I want to share with you this morning is it is not the foundational purpose of stewardship. Let me say that again. Raising money for your church is important, but it's not the foundational purpose of stewardship. For many congregations, unfortunately, that's all the stewardship is about. It's about that fall campaign. It's about the estimate of giving cards. It's about the little box in the church that tells, in the bulletin that tells how much we didn't get last week, how much we should have gotten, how much we wish we got. Stewardship is about more than that. It's about the relationships that we have with each other, with God, with Jesus Christ, and the relationship we have with the blessings and the possessions that God has given us. And that's our job. I mentioned that Phyllis has invited me to come to Susquehanna Conference a number of times. I've had workshops with a number of the finance people from your churches. Can you imagine that I had the nerve to tell the finance people that spreadsheets don't excite all of us? Now, there's some of you out there, maybe maybe a spreadsheet makes your heart beat fast. And that's fine. We need you. But there are some of us who want to hear about the people, who want to hear about the lives that are touched. We talked about doing those budgets, those narrative budgets, to describe what the mission of the church does. Because we want to see faces. We want to see people whose lives are touched, both here in our communities, here in the conference, and around the world. Because it's all about relationships. This young man who comes to see Jesus in the passage that I read for you this morning, sometimes we call him the rich young ruler, the rich young man. I just call him Joe, because I can't say the rich young ruler every time. But Joe, Joe comes to Jesus. And he wants to experience the kingdom of God. He wants Jesus to somehow stamp his ticket and say, you're in, you're going to go. And Jesus asks him, you know, about, well, you know, do you know what the commandments are? Have you followed the commandments? And he says, yes, I've done this since I was young. And he probably has. And then he, he does a strange thing. He tells the man that he needs to 
to give away the possessions that he has. He needs to give them to the poor. Now, how many times have we heard this passage preached as a show me the money kind of passage? As an example for all of us of what we need to give. But I think it's a passage that's about, you had me at hello. It's about the relationship that God wants to have with this Joe, with this rich young man. And Jesus says, you're on the right track, you've got it. You're, you're close to that relationship that you desire, that experiencing that kingdom of God, all you need to do is you need to get rid of the stuff that's in the way. And you can just, you can just get rid of it, give it where you want, give it to the poor, get it out, clear it out, get rid of it. And then you can experience the relationship. But Jesus realizes what we know at the end of the story is that as much as this man wants that ticket to the kingdom punched, he's holding fast to those things that seem to him to give security in life. Having that big portfolio, having those investments, owning that land, owning those things. All those are things that seem to grant some kind of security in life. And as much as he holds on to those, he doesn't have to put his trust in God. And you know, for us to have this relationship with God, God wants our trust as well. God wants us to rely on him. The covenant says, if you will be my people, I will be your God. And part of that is the trust that God will meet the needs that we have. You heard the passage earlier today about the widow who gave those those copper coins that she had. We also know there's a parable in there about about a, a man who has a great harvest and is all excited about it and says, oh, this is great. I'm going to build big barns and I'm going to store up all my stuff in these barns so I don't have to worry about anything. And Jesus says, well, <clears throat> sorry, it, this very night you're going to give up your life. That That doesn't buy you security. But what he celebrates in the passage about the widow who gave those two coins is the amount of trust that it took for her to be in that kind of relationship with God, to let go of even that small amount of security, that little bit of a nest egg. Zacchaeus is another example. We celebrate Zacchaeus. Now, Zacchaeus wasn't asked to give everything. Zacchaeus gave half of what he had to the poor, and then he settled people he had cheated fourfold in the settlement. But what he did was he let go. And he put trust in a new place. He put trust in God. I attended a, uh, a gathering last November of ecumenical stewardship folks, stewardship leaders. Phyllis and I were just talking about their, their gathering and Um, I heard a woman speak who's a professor at one of the seminaries in Indianapolis. Her name was Carol Johnston. And she told of a research project. She'd gotten a grant to work on a research project to study generosity in churches. She went across the country talking in different churches, in different settings. Some of them were very affluent areas. Some of them were in economically depressed areas. But talking about people with people and their giving and interviewing people. And she asked a variety of questions, and her findings, I thought, were fascinating. And one of the questions she asked people, and this one particularly stuck with me, is she said, do you feel like you make enough money? And what she said was that in every single instance that she asked that question, the answer was, well, if I just made a little bit more, If I just made a little bit more. The implication was that there was a level just beyond where I am that would really make me feel comfortable and secure. And these were people in generous churches. She told a specific story of a young woman who was 35 who had had 
degrees from Harvard and Yale and a, B, a bachelor's degree and an MBA, was working in New York, at 35 had become the vice president of development of a prominent corporation. She had a beautiful condominium in New York City. She had another home. And she answered the same way. She said, well, you know, I'm just not quite there. And it amazed me. In her conclusion about her interviews, Dr. Johnson wrote this. She said, from a Christian perspective, you see, security comes from relationships, healthy relationships, healthy relationships with family, with community, but ultimately with God. But we live in a society in which relationships of all kinds have been unraveling for decades. In order for people to change the way they think about and use money, the focus needs to shift from money as the measure of wealth and security to the only true security there is, placing your life in God's hands, trusting in God, and learning to build healthy relationships in this life, healthy families, healthy communities, and a healthier world. Does that speak to anyone here? Does it speak to the congregations in which you serve? I mean, let's be true about it. As a laity, you are the ones who carry most of the weight for the stewardship message. I mean, you will be the ones who will communicate to one another. Some of you will be on finance committees and stewardship teams. Some of you will lead campaigns. Some of you will be involved in small groups within your church that will be wrestling with these issues of giving. Understanding that at the heart of this is our ability our, to trust in God and our desire to be in that kind of a trusting relationship. It's not about the church needs to pay these bills. It's about what we as individuals, those of us who sit in the pews, clergy and lay, what we see is, as our relationship with God and how we trust in that relationship. You know, I thought about, yesterday when I was on the plane, I thought about the idea that our money, our bills and our coins... Those of you who still use that paper and metal stuff. It all says, in God we trust. In God we trust. Maybe someone knew that we needed a reminder. That it's that relationship that guarantees our security. I could go on and on. I have, a, I have a story that I love to tell. One of the joys about being invited to preach other places is you get to bring these stories back that you use in your local church and you had to file away because, you know, you can't keep using the same stories again. But one of my favorite stories is a story about a man who was a tightrope walker. You know, one of those guys who went around looking for a place, some kind of huge expanse that they could stretch a wire across and he could walk across. And so he found this one place, this canyon, and they stretched a wire across it. And one day he announced that he was going to go and walk across that, that deep, deep canyon on this thin, thin wire. And the crowd gathered. And they were excited to see him walk. And so he got up on the wire and he got his big pole out and he held his pole and he carefully walked across that wire. A couple of times he kind of, you know, wobbled and, and got his balance again and he got to the other side and he turned around and the quiet crowd was hushed as he walked back and, and they cheered for him. And then the next thing is he did is he got the, a shorter pole. And everybody said, ooh and ah, and he went across with the shorter pole, and he made his way back, and they all cheered for him. And then he put the pole down, and he put a blindfold on. And he walked across that wire with the blindfold on, and he walked back, and the crowd went crazy. And then he got down off the wire, and some people thought he was done, and then to the surprise, he came back up to the wire 
carrying a a wheelbarrow, full-size garden wheelbarrow. And he turned to the crowd and he said, do you think that I can walk across this wire pushing this wheelbarrow? And the crowd went crazy. Yes, yes, we think you can do it. And he said to the crowd, do you think I can walk across this wire pushing this wheelbarrow blindfolded? And their noise was even more. And they were, yes, yes, we believe, we believe you can do it. And then he pointed to one person in the audience. And he said to this one man, he said, do you, do you believe that I can push this wheelbarrow across this wire blindfolded? And the man said, yes, I believe it. And the tightrope walker said, okay, come and get in the wheelbarrow. (laughs) Friends, come and get in the wheelbarrow. What if we went back to our churches this Sunday and we told our folks that we understand that what God is looking for us is not a show-me-the-money kind of relationship. But I I had you, you had me at hello kind of relationship. What God is looking for is a relationship that's founded on our trust in God as being able to take care of our needs and to meet our needs. What if we told them that what God is looking for is our conviction that the covenant that God has offered us in Scripture, the promises that God has given us, are good and worthy of our trust. And that we show that trust by loosening our grip on the other things that the world has told us is going to give us security. What if we went back and we told them that stewardship is about trusting God enough to get in the wheelbarrow? Would you pray with me? Gracious God, we give you thanks and praise that you loved us so much. Before we were born, before we could do anything that would even begin to deserve that kind of a loving response. That love was there. You, you had it. We had you at hello. Lord, we confess to you that we haven't always lived in the midst of that relationship. We've talked about it, but we haven't lived it out in the way we trust. And the things we invest in, to find some sense of security. Gracious God, we want to ask that in our lives and in the lives of our churches that we might be called to that relationship of trust. As laity of this church, Lord, of this conference, of this denomination, may we be the example that set for the world of people who put our trust in you, who know that your word is good, who know that your covenant is strong, that you loved us so much that you sent your son to die for us that we might know the depths of your love. Help us to live in that relationship to live in that trust. For we prayed and we lifted to you in the name of your Son, our Savior, we pray. Amen.